Run, run a, a shot, shot across, across the, the bow. bow. Run, run a, a shot, shot across, across the bow. bow. Hey, good evening, everybody. This is Bobby Blackjack, and this is my Pirates Plank podcast, all about Seton Hall basketball and Big East and college basketball, the whole nine yards. I believe this is episode number three. Let's call this the uh, three for all, since we have mainly three big topics to, to discuss this week, again, um, this is Bobby Blackjack, as I mentioned, graduate of Seton Hall University and now part of their media throng who covers the team, and I enjoy what I do there, and of course, uh, being a part of the Seton Hall basketball Facebook fan page, where you know I love giving the updates from uh, Press Row there, I kind of miss it, but hey, we're back there in about six months or so, seven months. Anyway, let's get to episode three, Pirates Plank. Let's start off with uh, congratulating fellow Seton Hall alum Danny Hurley on winning the national championship Monday night with the uh, UConn Huskies, um, who, with, uh, I believe, win number five, I believe uh, it was CBS Sports, so I, I enjoy reading um, and and. You know, reading their content and whatnot and analyzing you know, the stories and you know, come up with my own thoughts, obviously. But uh, I like them more than ESPN. But I believe I believe CBS Sports now lists UConn as a blue blood in the sport of men's collegiate basketball with their fifth title. Um, hey, Danny Hurley did not have it easy. As we know, he came to Seton Hall um you know, he had a bit of a bout of depression midway through his tenure with us as our point guard. Um, on the road, he'd, he'd be viciously attacked with uh, Bobby's bed or, you know, in relation to his brother, who at that time was, you know, becoming, you know, I'm not sure the, the lineage or the age difference off the top of my head, but, you know, Bobby started Duke, had that uh, really promising brief NBA career before the uh, car accident. Um, so, as you could say, as you, as you, make me, you can assume, Danny was always the second fiddle for a good part of his, uh, basketball days, whether it be playing or coaching. Uh, he played at Seton Hall, and I think, uh, you know, there wasn't really any pro ball to think of. I'm not sure if he played in Europe or not after uh, graduating, but you know what? He had the coaching bug, not, um... Not shocking, considering who his dad is, right? Bobby Hurley Sr., legendary coach of St. Anthony's in Jersey City, which has since closed down. Actually met Bobby Hurley Sr. while covering a game at Rothman Center for an F- uh, FDU game. Um, he was there sitting behind me. I was in the press area, and he was like right behind me. And I just had to say at least hello or or whatnot, because hey, he's a Jersey guy. He's, he's a legend. And obviously the coaching bug, the coaching genes went into both of his sons, Bobby at Arizona State, and of course Danny, who um, started off at, um, I think Wagner, right? And then he went over to uh, Rhode Island where I know he played, he coached uh, some of some of Elm Park's finest uh Basketball family, Dadikas, one of the Dadikas went there and played under Coach Hurley out in uh, Rhode Island. And then, uh, you know, eventually he makes his way down to Storrs, Connecticut, UConn, who, not surprisingly, rejoins the Big East a couple of years ago. And I thought it was kind of amusing that UConn never won a game um, and no, I'm sorry, never didn't lose a game outside of the Big East. All their losses this year came within the Big East. Of course, one of those losses were from our Seton Hall Pirates. I know a few people posted in the in the group that hey, uh, we uh, we beat the uh, national champions, but you know we're so f- way far away from what um, UConn can do. Um. And you know what? 
another uh, post that I, I remember seeing uh, stated something like, "Ah, eh, you know what? I'm happy for UConn. At least not. At least it's not Villanova." Exactly. I'm tired of seeing Villanova win. I don't care if Jay Wright's there or not anymore. I do not want to see Villanova and their smugness anymore at the top of the charts. Hopefully, it's our time eventually. You know, I, I mentioned this to a uh, little group of, um, you know, uh, moderators and stuff that uh, from the page, and you know, I want to celebrate like those fans celebrated in Houston, you know, for UConn. Of course, we'll never know for the COVID year. You know, I'm not going to keep bringing that up, but uh, that might have been our chance. But maybe there's one coming with our our new you know, coach Shaw and his his methods and his madness. Maybe that's coming to us as well. Maybe we'll be the Florida Atlantic soon. By the way, Florida Atlantic. Uh, Nick Boyd, my guy, my guy Nick Boyd, say um, Mary's Rutherford. They're bringing back all their starters next season. So, you know, while they, they fell a shot short, one point loss there in the Final Four, you know, they had an un, ungodly, what, 36 and 5? Something like that like, this year. So, they're on the map now, folks, and Florida Atlantic could make another run again. But this is about Danny Hurley and UConn. Yeah, congrats to a fellow alum. Always good to see a fellow alum do great things. The way Arturis Konishevis is the you know guy running the Chicago Bulls, or you know one day we're gonna we're gonna be, we're gonna proudly call Adrian Griffin head coach of an NBA franchise soon. Always good things. Um, now, if there's a if there's a bad side, a negative or a bad taste to UConn winning the national championship, is that. Uh, Sonogo should have been ours. Sonogo should have been our power forward to dominate in the paint. As we so dearly need some bigs on our team, which I'll get to in a moment, in uh, one of our three topics this evening. But, uh, you know, supposedly Sonogo was signed, sealed, and delivered to the Pirates until uh, a little green came into his hands from UConn. Speculation, of course, but probably true, right? Probably true. So, again, we can't fault UConn, and what's pretty scary is that the the guard, Jordan, I forgot his, his last name, I don't have my notes in front of me uh, for that, but um, he might go to the, to the NBA draft as a lottery player, but Adolfo Sinogo, um, what I read recently is that, you know, he's not considered a first-round talent, which is He's a pretty good player there. I'm surprised he's not listed in the latter part of the first round. So that being said, if he's not part of the first round um, yet, and I would fully expect him to, or it, I'm, not, I'm not sure if, if the cutoff date is, has come and gone yet. But you know, hey, they only finished playing Monday, right? So maybe he goes and tests the water while still keeping his eligibility in college. We'll see. But Snuggo should have been a Seton Hall Pirate. We all know that, Pirate fans, Pirate Nation. And all we can hope for is uh, that we get better. As I was saying, UConn, and uh, especially in CBS uh, Sports, already preseason number one for next year because they're retur- returning a good, co- uh, good core of their um, lineup, aside from the, uh, the Jordan kid, the guard, who will probably, will probably be a lottery pick. All right, so uh, that was topic number one, of course, UConn and Danny Hurley winning the national championship. Uh, of course, the, uh, another uh, big thing for uh, Pirate Nation in regards to uh, UConn's winning is that we get more of a windfall of um, earnings from them doing so well in the tournament, and you know the Big East gets a allotment of money and gets divided among its member programs. So maybe that, some of that money can go towards NIL, We'll see, and, help, and hopefully it does. Topic number two this evening on episode number three. Congrats to former Seton Hall center and assistant coach Grant Billmeyer on being named head coach of NJIT. Um, great spot, 
Personally, I think it's a great spot for him to begin his, his journey into the world of college basketball. Excuse me. And um, what I find pretty astonishing, folks, is that the Seton Hall alumni uh, coaching tree is now up to five in college uh, basketball, second only to Duke, who now have nine former coaches, or players, I'm sorry, coaching in the uh, college basketball ranks. So we're only second to Duke, who had Mike Krzyzewski there for, for eternity, churning out players, many of those players coming back to be assistant coaches, and then going on to head their own programs in college basketball land. So Coach Bill Meyer becomes number five under the Seton Hall uh, uh, alum tree. And, you know, you know, I was going through some of the boards, some of the postings and whatnot, you know, some people trashing, you know, why is he going to NGIT? I'm sure he makes more as an assistant coach in the, in a, in, in the Big Ten. Well, those hindsight of people seem to forget, okay, is that all it takes is one magical run at a smaller school in the Division One, which are over 300 of them. I'll get a number in a second uh, for you, but there's over 300 D1 college men's college basketball programs in the country, okay? So, I mean, there's only 300-something head coaches under that classification, while there could be thousands of assistant coaches out there. So Coach Bill Meyer is now one of 300-something, a head coach at a D1 school, one with a brand-new facility. Um, I haven't been there personally yet. Maybe I'll get a chance to check it out this season. Uh, it's supposed to be state-of-the-art right there in Newark, you know, in the center of all the basketball uh of, of the Northeast, that's so great at all different levels, high school, college, pro, right? And as I was saying, all it takes is one magical run like Tobin Anderson had at FDU, the way our own coach Shane Holloway had at St. Peter's. One magical run for Coach Bill Meyer to then use that as a stepping stone to a bigger program. Okay, so he, he, you know he's not he now he's, he's not in the fraternity of D one college basketball coaches. We know he has coaching shops because there was a couple of games he filled in for Coach Willard and did it very well. Uh, if not mistaken, uh, Mister Bill Meyer is like something like two and zero or three and zero in his career as a head coach for those games he covered for Coach Willard. And uh, you know it's good for a Jersey guy to come back home and, and coach at Jersey program. And I believe, which is, should be pretty interesting, uh, I'm going to see if I can try to get to this um, next season. Coach Bill Meyer will go against Coach Copeland at Wagner this year. So that should be pretty cool to see, uh, you know, much like, you know, uh, Coach Copeland played our team this year. Magner, no, Magner played Seton Hall at the Proust Center. Um, wasn't necessarily a close game, but maybe like an NGIT versus Wagner. I have a little more uh, panache now with two Seton Hall alum coaching each respective program. And I joked uh, also that, you know, let's cue the Tyree Samuel rumors going to NGIT to get one more. Because I, I always thought that Tyrese was going to go to Maryland to get one more year of seasoning under Coach Bill Meyer as a big man coach. Hey, now he gets a chance to, uh, you know, go a few miles to the east of the uh, South Orange Seat Hall campus. And, but no, I can't see that happening. If anything, I, I see him still going to Maryland and coaching for um, you know, Coach Willard and, you know, maybe banging some bodies with some Big Ten guys fortifying his chance of being a G League player. Again, like I mentioned in the last podcast, Tyree Samuel is not an NBA player. Not not now. Not going to say ever, but he certainly is not 
right now, and he's he's not even a G League player at this point. So, again, um, Coach Bill Meyer, congrats to you. Congrats to Coach Hurley. Those are two big coaching um, uh, tidbits of this Pirates Plank podcast, Episode 3. And, hey, if you're a Seton Hall Pirate like I am, Pirate Nation, be proud. There are now five of us out there coaching D1 programs, second only to the hated Duke program. All right, my last uh, bit of information this evening would be our, our recent signing. Okay? Hold on one second. One second here. Oh, by the way, I noticed also today, um, not to get off topic, but I noticed also that they released the matchups for the Big East Big 12 um, pairings uh, next season, and we travel to Baylor University. I don't know why. I don't know. I don't know what the rhyme and reason is. I, I guess it's. I, I don't know. If anybody knows, please let me know or respond in the comments. But uh, I'm guessing it's it's level of play. Like you have UConn playing Kansas, right? So maybe you know, we're maybe maybe a middle of the pack program still, which is hard to believe because uh, you know we have so many holes to fill at this moment. But uh, yeah, we're playing at Baylor. So another road game, another chance to. Jump on the boards and all watch the uh, Pirates together and comment on what's going on on the screen. All right, so um, again, so David Tubek, item number three this week. David Tubek, a consensus three-star player, has signed on to the Pirates. Uh, class of 2023, listed as a small forward slash power forward, 6'8", but a late bloomer to college basketball. Kind of seems like, wasn't that the same thing with uh, Ike, right? He was a late starter. He played soccer in his country, I believe, before. Maybe even uh, Romero Gill, too. But, um, sorry, so we have our first signing. Um, hey, to me, it's a body. It's a body that Coach Shaw can develop. It's a, obviously, he's a, he's a player that was on a lot of teams' radar because um, he had all, uh, he had offers from schools, like, before the process, before he committed to Memphis. Memphis is, uh, as we know, Penny Hardaway, rising program. You know, um, we beat him this year, actually, but they did make the uh, tournament. Matter of fact, uh, they lost by a layup to the aforementioned Florida Atlantic Owls in the first round of, of the uh, of March Madness. Um, so he had, so he decommitted from Memphis after they started bring, bringing in a bunch of uh, threes and fours, which would limit his play time, obviously. So he sides with Seton Hall, but even beforehand and even afterwards, um, he had looks and offers from Kansas Blue Blood. Texas, close to a blue blood, Arizona State, Bobby Hurley, Creighton, and Xavier, two of the upper echelon programs who I believe are both Sweet 16 teams this year. Uh, and he visited before that Pitt, VTech, and West Virginia. So there's not somebody, uh, this is how, uh, folks, this is how I look at it. Look at those, those are some top programs there that were looking at this kid, Tubek, for their program, okay? It's not like, uh, you know, he had offers from Stony Brook, Binghamton, Albany, Maine, you know, New Hampshire, Monmouth. Again, not citing those programs whatsoever. Just highlighting that David Tubek had the attention of some pretty big programs, so that in itself should tell you something that Coach Shaw seen in him and and might be considered ourselves lucky to have the guy. Maybe one day we'll be saying that. Um, not everybody's thrilled, thrilled with the uh, signing. I can tell that from the boards. But you know, it is what it is. Everybody's got their opinion, and I just told you mine. Look at those programs that wanted him before we got him. And, you know, think about it. 
if they thought he was worthy of a look or a scholarship offer, he's got to have some kind of tangible asset to be a part of a program, correct? That's what I think. Also, he played for the um, New Jersey Scholars program, um, AEU program in the EYBL League, uh, same team with DJ Wagner, one of the top two players in the country uh, coming out of high school this year. So those those coaches have uh, ties to Coach Shaw and his coaches. So there's another link there I kind of like, that maybe they got some really good inside information on the poten- potential for David Tubek. And uh, you know what? He himself, Mr. Tubek, Considers, considers himself to be like Kawhi Leonard, who maybe has been quiet the past two years of injuries and whatnot, but there was one time, folks, that Kawhi Leonard was a top three player in the NBA. So if he's that confident in his abilities that he compares himself to Kawhi, hey, uh, another bonus uh, in my book. And uh, others see him as a Jimmy Butler Chris Middleton type of player. Again, fine with me. Potential galore. Hopefully our coaching staff could coach him up and make him a serv- make him a player for our rotation. One thing I want to look at real quick, folks. Hold on. Now, I saw a chart earlier. Somebody posted a chart of the current scholarship situation in for the Pirates. And, you know, we can, again, we all know we can use some bigs. I believe the only true power forward we have right now technically is Dre Davis. Right? So, hey, maybe Tubek can come in and learn this year. Of course, play. Of course, get some uh, some run in. Learn. Give us some minutes uh, off the bench. And uh, give us some minute and, and be a player. And Drake Davis, as everybody had seen this year, folks, to me he was the glue guy on the Seton Hall team. When he was out for an extended period of time in the middle of the season, Drake Davis, the team suffered. When Drake Davis played, the team did well. So you know, Drake Davis is that small forward slash power forward slash type player who he can maybe work under and get better with. Now, his brother Trey Davis, he's the power forward. He's the big guy who, you know, I think is going to take a big leap next year. Um, another year of seasoning, practicing with the, with the team and the coaches, and uh, will give us some minutes in, in the, one of the big uh, positions there. And, folks, you know, don't get hung up so much on – the fact that David Tubek was a two- or three-star prospect. And I'm going to tell you why right now. The aforementioned Romero Gill was a zero-star prospect. Okay? The one-year sensation Casey and Defo at one point was a zero-star prospect. Prospect. So, what does that tell me, folks? While you, you could put some pretty serious credence into these uh, publications and, the, and their ratings of players, but they don't always get it right. Look, look at college football, where you know when it comes time around the Super Bowl, they, they you know, the, you know those, that two weeks leading up to the big game, right? They they have uh, two weeks to try to fill uh, with with content, and there's always that article that says, "Well, hey, look at the uh, rosters of both teams, and looking back at their college years, uh, a majority of those players were three star players, and not five star players." Well, that happens. It's also true for college basketball; they don't always get it right. Maybe David Tubek is leaning more to a four star with his potential. Maybe he's leaning more towards a solid three-star. But my point being, they don't always get it right. 
and recently on under the you know in our seen Hall pirate um teams of of late we have seen prime examples of zero star players who did big things Romano Gill made a name for himself got himself a uh, G League contract a pro contract in Australia and you know what? I'm going to have to reach out to his aunt and maybe we'll get him on a show or get some information on what he's doing now on a future episode of Pirates Plank. And, of course, Casey and Defo was the bloodline, the heart and soul of Coach Shaw's first team as a Seton Hall Pirate coach. You know, coming back from that run last year and, you know, I tell you, Casey and Defo is maybe 6'5". And he plays a hell of a lot bigger. That's how, that's how good he, he really was. And I would imagine Casey and Defo, based on my uh, knowledge of the, of the pro game and, and whatnot, I could see him sneaking into a uh, G League roster somewhere, kind of like um, a few of our guys have in the past, like uh, 